format that's not going to give us not going to give us too much structure. Um, so, let's see. so, um, so for each, we're going to store this as a, as an item in a key um, value pair. So th this is not as important in the original story, but it'll be an important representation in the in intermediate step of MapReduce as well. So you're going to have some some key which describes, which is some sort of um, not necessarily unique identifier for the data, but is, is something that refers to how you want to organize the data and then the value. And some examples of this might be um, um, where the key, you, you, you'd have some log ID and then the value is just a log. So if you have a store of logs, um, like each, each user that you measure something from, you have some ID that you refer to, and this is just the log of whatever the user is. You can, you can put whatever in the value here. You can, you, can, you can go and look into it later, but you want to know that this is a log, right? Um, so you could have uh, like a web address, and then this is, is all the information we stored about this web page. Right, so this web page is the value. So this may contain all the list of the links and also the keywords on this page could be included in here. Or you could just store the, all the HTML to actual pages. Um, in case you want to, you don't have to send a crawler back out to get it if you wanted to run some different sort of um, feature on it to, to determine um, this, the similarity with the query. Right, so you want to build to something else, you can go do it. So, so Google probably stores most of the web on a server somewhere. Um, maybe in, in multiple different locations. Um, you could have um, um, like a document um, ID and and then the value is, is just going to be the text of the document. Right, so some of you have looked at, so for instance if you look at, the, there's some Wikipedia days that I think maybe some of you are looking working with or worked with for the project. And uh, th there's there's some text associated with each Wikipedia page, and this is just maybe the, the is the name of the page. So then you'll go and you'll scan all the text. Right. Um, right. Um, so, so these might be how the how the data is stored. You just have so th this is this is at the lowest level here. Um, so these things are still local. So we haven't totally, you know, eschewed this locality. We've we've kept we've kept the local part in, in here. Um, okay. So th so this is the first level, and then at the next level, you have um, blocks of, um, of of data, and so each so you want to see so, you, so uh, a, an entire HDFS file is not just going to be one of these documents because uh, it's going to be a whole set of these documents, right? Instead of just one web address, the file may be the entire web, right? So you have all of the web pages that you keep in your corpus. This you think of as one file, but you, this, each of these files will not fit on a hard drive, right? This is your entire data set you think of as the file. And so we break it up into these blocks. Is and that like sharding? Yes, uh, so it's it's kind of a way of sharding, except um, sometimes sharding is more specific to structure of the problem. But it's so they do column wise and row wise sharding. Yeah, yeah. So so you, you can think of doing that, but we're not we don't really have columns or rows. We just have a set of uh, of, of these exactly. key value pairs, right? And so so in, like an HDFS block is going to be about um, sixty four megabytes of um, uh, of, of these items. So generally, you assume that 64 megabytes is enough for one of the items. If not, then you break it up into two items. So each item has multiple key value pairs? No, uh, a key value pair here is an it item. Is an item, okay. Right, so, so, so these are examples. Okay. Right. Um, and so, so a block is going to be 64 megabytes or so. This, this number you can you can change this when you build your HDFS. Um, it used to be 
common for it to be only 32 megabytes, but now I think the common value is usually 64 megabytes. Um, okay, so um, so you know you block this data, but then these blocks are going to be the kind of the core unit of the storage of the of, of the distributed file system, and and each one is going to be replicated. Um, so, so at the block level, you're going to have replication. And so usually two times or um, three times, I think. Um, so for in if you're doing this for like in a smaller cluster, you may only do twice because you're more worried about space. But if you're, if you're Google and space is you know, cheap compared to how much you may, you probably do something like three times. Um, so you, you're going to replicate each of these blocks. and and these blocks are also going to be um, distributed. So in particular, each of the replications is going to be stored on a separate one of these um, separate one of these machines. And there's probably some actual hierarchy of these machines. There, are, there's probably um, they're probably stored in um, in a, what are they called? Stacks, what? Racks. A uh, rack, yeah. So they're probably racks of, of machines that may be like 16 machines. So the, the cluster we've we've played with here, and I mean our group only has uh, 16 machines, so we so, so we just have one rack. But you in Google they'll have multiple racks, so they'll have many of these racks. So the ones in the racks you want to be uh, um, are you can get data in between those a little bit faster than going off rack. Um, but when you're doing this, this uh, distributed um, uh, replication, you want even the, the blocks that are replicated to be on different ones of the racks. Right? So if, a whole, if the link to a whole rack goes down, then, then you can still get to one of the other uh, replicas of the blocks. Okay. Um, so, so if your data is already if your data is already big, when you replicate it two or three times, um, that's even bigger. Right? And so, if you're doing high performance computing, um, they really shy away from doing this two or three times replication. They say, I'm, I'm already trying to fill my machines to the limit. I want to go, I'm going to put as much data on there as a hold and see what I can do. I'm not willing to actually do this replication. And inside of uh, you know, this distributed file system, um, they they they're really embracing this replication. I think there are some people pushing this for um, high performance computing, but I, I don't know if that's going to get traction. Um, they're usually trying to do workarounds where they do kind of recovery of it instead of instead of actually just replicating. So it makes things a lot simpler. In uh, high performance computing, they do like offline stuff as well. Because I, I attended a seminar on high performance computing and they said most of it is real time so you have streaming data coming in and they just process it while it's streaming and coming in. Like they discussed that they do PayPal trans fraud detection and PayPal transactions and it's just streaming data transaction coming in and they flag the uh, fraud data and then send it in. Yeah so you know I think most of this sort of streaming analysis is going to be on it's probably going to be actually on some version related to MapReduce instead of HPC. A lot of HPC is doing these large scientific simulations where you have you load data in and then you simulate it and you're keeping full state of the state of the simulation. Like weather, weather. Yeah, like you're doing these large weather simulations or ocean simulations or like uh, nuclear energy simulations. These sorts of things where. The, the data is changing all the time. You keep updating your state, um, and uh, so, so you have the initial state stored somewhere, but then you can't keep all the intermediate states. You don't want to replicate all the intermediate states. Um, so, and it, the, the simulation needs to kind of be be going. Uh, you know, it's it's moving forward in, in time, and so where MapReduce says your data is static, we're going to make some pass over the data and come up with something. So it's, there's now there's streaming versions as well. There's like um, there's like Twitter Storm. It's like a thing developed in Twitter. Is that like the Hoop or 
it's kind of like Hadoop, but it combines it with streaming data. Um, and so there's a different version that they built in Facebook that does this. And so for MapReduce is for these like offline computations. And then, but Twitter and, and like the timeline in Facebook, these needs to be updated as soon as new data is coming in. And you want to be able to search that. And they have like page too. rank, and they see how many likes and comments you have, and then they, the weight gets stronger, and then they Right, right. So, so this has to be done in, in real time, and it needs a different architecture. Uh, it's based kind of on this, but it also incorporates things from, um, from what's it called? From like, uh, um, from like distributed hash tables, which are used for, uh, um, which is used for um, like if you're downloading movies in a maybe non-legal way off the internet. Um, so it's it's kind of combines these two technologies and it's pretty cool stuff. So um, I'll be teaching a seminar next semester where I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of these different uh, technologies and how to think about computation. Um, okay, so, uh, right, um, so, so so, so then, I don't know. This is basically how the distributed file system is set up. You have you have these uh, um, these 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 individual items and these key value pairs, and uh, we're going to think of these as our as our quantities we're going to work with. Um, but the blocks of data we're going to do with one block at a time. So there are going to be multiple blocks in each machine, but each machine will process just one block at a time. And so things may be local to some degree within a block, but outside of that, you throw away locality entirely. So you want things to be as non-local as possible outside of a block. And the reason why you do this is, say you have, say you have some large timeline of logs, right? And so, so these are some logs. And then something, something weird happened, uh, maybe some time ago, in this. You know, um, in this time period of your of your log, there was some strange event, and you want to analyze um, something that happened in here. Now, if you store this completely locally, so you partitioned up up your data, so this is on one machine, this is on another machine, this is you know, and all these are on different machines. Then, when you want to look at these logs, two machines are responsible for this whole range. And these other machines aren't doing anything. So after this blocking, where you have things that are really close to each other, um, you know this arbitrary 64 megabyte block size, then you want to distribute these across different computers. So instead, you would break up this, uh, you, would, you, would, you would break up these logs into these smaller chunks, and each of these is a block. So each of these little things is going to be a block, and they're each going to be on a different computer from it. So, so then when you want to analyze this log, they're probably distributed pretty well across all the different computers. So you can then send all of your computational power to look at this region at once. And the thing is, when you were storing it, um, you didn't know that this region was going to be interesting. Maybe it wasn't even this 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 uh, this local region. Maybe it was like something weird happened every second Tuesday of the month, right? So it was one piece here, one piece here, one piece here. So then maybe this this distributed way would work well too. But if you if you have these blocks and they're kind of distributed randomly among the computers, then you're they're still going to be spread out pretty well among the different computers you have. Um, remember, one of the first things we did in class, we looked at where you took data and you, and you randomly assign it to these bins, right? The same concept is working here. It's not going to be a perfect distribution, but it's going to be pretty close if you're doing this. And you're probably going to not have too many in any, in any, one, of the, any one of the computers. Um, and there's a cool trick when you're replicating this data, there's this thing called the power of two choices. And it's saying that well, we looked at this thing where by the time you had something in every bin, you had at most, you may have had about log n things in one of the bins. Um, 
So, so this was uh, the um, our, um, so if we get this had to do with the birthday paradox, but wait. Okay, so, so the birthday paradox was you needed about yeah. So, so you're gonna have about an average about log n things in each bit, um, and probably actually not too many more than log n things in any one bit. But if you if for every for every item you threw in one bit, you threw it in two bits, then it's gonna be then if you look at the if you if you then um, had the bins handle one item at a time until you handle all the items, it's going to work much better. You're not going to have a skewed of a distribution in some sense. So by replicating a couple times, two or three times, the skew is going to be greatly diminished as well. So the, the replication allows you to to deal with if if some of the if the rack or the computer goes down, and it also allows you to um, to um, to, to balance a load much, much better than if you just threw random things out there. Um, all right, so, so so now we can now we can finally talk about uh, MapReduce. And so let's go over here. So, um, so so now that we have this structure set up, MapReduce is going to be actually um, actually painfully simple. Right, so, so there are going to be three or three and a half steps that, that any MapReduce algorithm is going to have. So um, the first um, step is, 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 of course, we, we is going to be the mapping step. And what this is going to do is it's going to look at each item individually, and you're going to write a program that's, say, um, for each item, you know, I'm going to say, um, for um, each uh, for each item, then I want to do something with with this item, right? And so you just have to write this, and then the the MapReduce framework will go and process this on each item. It'll go and figure out to make sure it handles. Um, every single item in your storage space, and have different computers run this dysfunction. And what this will do is it's going to take each item and transform this into a set of these key value pairs. Into a, another set of key value pairs. And so this is a set notation, one item may actually be a bunch of key value pairs, but they're usually something simpler, something more specific um, that you want to look at. So if you've ever looked at these log files associated with these large data stores, they have lots of information, right? Sometimes they have information that no one even knows what that information means anymore, but it was built into the log file. No one wants to actually try and take that out. So there's lots of stuff in the log file that you probably don't need. And this mapping goes and says, I'm going to go and grab the parts that matter. Maybe I care about just the customer and the and and if the customer bought milk, right? So, so I, and this is going to be somewhere in this key value pair. So, the, so, so typically, the key is, is going to have to do with, um, you know, um, how you um, um, compare or um, sort the data. And and the value is is has to do with the um, the actual um, um, the actual content. And I'll go through a few examples in, in a minute after I, after I lay this out. So so the key will allow you to you're going to have different sorts of the data, and maybe you have a, a certain customer. If you go into a grocery store, you swipe your 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 card, the, the membership card, and they keep track of every time you come through. And so, now, the log ID is that in particular transaction, but which customer came through is stored as part of the log. And then, so that may be the key. You want to say, I want to look at, I want to group together all the purchases of this one customer, and then the value is going to be the actual um, things in the purchases that you want to look at. 
okay? Um, so it's going to be a very simple function. Each item you're going to, you know, break it into these key value pairs. And maybe in the example I gave with the log, each item you only broke into one uh, key value pair, but it could be a set. If this is going to be a, a document with a bunch of text, maybe you want to do something like look for, if you're like the, if you're um, some government that's monitoring some, some tweets or some messages, some transcripts, there are certain keywords you want to look for. If any of the keywords come up, then you want to um, like mark the key as the person who's sending, the, who's writing the keyword, and the value as um, maybe that keyword as well as maybe some text around it that you're going to go and analyze. Right. So this captures the value, will capture the information you're going to analyze, and the key is the the the, the person who you or the the item that you want to aggregate stuff to. Okay. So this. Um, so this is the mapping. This is the mapping step, and it's usually going to be very, very simple. Okay. So, um, can you guess what the next step is going to be? The first one is the map. Reduce. Uh, wrong. That's the third step. Um, that was a trick question. Um, so, this, so the next step is the shuffle step, and then the third step will be the reduce step. Um, Okay, so, so, and there's actually a 1.5 step, we'll get back to this. So, the, um, so the, the shuffle step, what it's going to do is it's going to do all the magic um, behind MapReduce. It's going to move um, all um, key value pairs. Um, um, so, um, so, so if um, K1, um, B1, and K2, B2 have um, key, if, if the keys are the same, um, then these are going to be on the same um, machine. And this really means in, this, in the same block. So the shuffle step is reorganizing the data. Initially, your data is spread across all, all of the machines in some way. And you're, you're going and looking at all the data that you have in some, some distributed data set. And then you want to um, do some local aggregation about something. You want to know some pattern about everything a customer's every purchase. So some of the customer's data is here, some of it's here, some of it's here. You need to bring it all to one machine. And so because you've mapped it into these key value pairs, then you're going to use the key to try and sort or shuffle these items and re-aggregate them. Uh, earlier you said it's replicated two or three times. Yeah. So if the key is same, doesn't it mean it's a replica of it? So the, the black magic behind MapReduce will take care of this and make sure you see it once. Okay. So the, there's... This, all this replication is, is hidden from the user. Okay, is, so the key is same and the value is same, then it will do a set and get rid of the duplicate. Um, it depends. Sometimes you want to count something. And so then if it occurs twice, you want to know it occurs twice. Sometimes you just want to know which things exist, and then you can't do that. So there are certain classes of things, like um, if an operation is item tokens, is a term that means that if you see, essentially it means if you see two of the same item, you can get rid of one. So like an operation like taking the max of the data set is going to be item points, where the it, sum is not. Does it add a primary key to the key value and it is the ID that it generates, which is a unique ID which is appended to each key value? Uh, not necessarily. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that. Okay. But, uh, um, the key the key before may have been something so you could reference each of the each of those the elements in your data set. But here the key serves for the shuffle step to bring these things together. So the, the, the key here is only needed to to kind of figure out how to move them together. So how does the shuffle actually work? Usually you have some you kind of define some ordering over the keys. It could be the alphabetical order of their text, they could be numbers. And then you're essentially going to do something like you're going to, you're just going to sort 
all the keys. So this is sometimes called the sort step. Um, and, and so you sort them across all your machines and you put you know, all the things which are between you know, some value and another value on the same machine. And you don't exactly sort them. Um, what you can do is you can pick a bunch of um, random elements and say these are the breakpoints. And, and anything that falls between, you sort the random subset, and if anything falls between the two items of your random subset, they get back to the same machine. And this does a pretty good approximate sorting job, but it guarantees things with the same key will go to the same machine. Um, so, but there's some, there are different ways of implementing the shuffle step, and, and there's sometimes you can actually go in and implement it slightly different to yourself. But most people, you know, don't touch the shuffle step. Everything is done behind the scenes. Um, so then the reduce step is it's going to, um, so, so again the reduce step is going to be um, um, for each key, right? So this was for each item originally. And now this is going to take um, each, each key and then you're going to write this function here on, on the key and, and the set of the values. So you have a bunch of key value pairs with the same key. And so the key is going to be the same, but the values might be different. And so your function is going to take in whatever the key was and, and all of the values that appeared anywhere from any of the data items um, that had the same key. And then this is going to output um, on something. And it generally, um, um, this is also going to be a key value pair. Um, so you can just represent it. Um, it's the, the internal structure is often a key value pair. But you can output something else with you. And sometimes each set here will output a set of key value pairs as well. It doesn't need to be just one. So and all you need to write here is this function which takes in for each key and for the set of values how to transform the main. Um, everything else is done for you. The, the MapReduce system takes care of distributing this work across all of the nodes. Okay. Um, so, and this, this one thing that happens a lot when you deal with these big machines is that uh, these big these big clusters is sometimes one of the machines is, is going to fail. And when the machine fails, maybe it was in the middle of doing this process of mapping. Um, and then things, um, and then things are going to kind of get weird. You started producing these key value pairs, and, uh, and then the, um, the machine dies. And so what happens? So, well, um, if you're worrying about this all yourself, or if you're writing code for HPC, you need to worry about this. But MapReduce will do this all behind the scenes. It, it'll keep, there'll be one master node, and there are versions that have replicate master nodes in case that goes down. But there'll be one master node which keeps pinging the machines to check if they're still running as usual. And if they get really slow or they, they fail, it'll say, ah, this machine was working on these blocks. Now I need to go find where the replicated blocks are. And I'll find the machines that have those replicated blocks. And if I have uh, two to choose from, then one of those will be less busy than the other ones. And I'll go ask that one to do the computation that the failed machine was supposed to do. And it'll check this and do this all behind the scenes to make sure that, that this actually works. It'll take care of that if it happens in the mapping step or the reduce step, and it'll do the shuffle behind the scenes so you are, are able to do the reduce step on all things with the same key, even if this was distributed. Right? So there's, there's one more step. This is step 1.5, and I'd write it up here, but I, I didn't save some space for it. And so, this is something you can sometimes do after the mapping step, before the shuffle step. Um, and this is called the combiner. And so, what you do is, 
if you're going, if you have multiple things with the same key coming out of the same block, then you can kind of um, do what you would do in, in the reduce step um, ahead of time before the shuffle. So if you have like a hundred different keys, a hundred different key, item, key value pairs with the same key, they're all going to go to the same computer in the, sh in the shuffle step. And then you're going to run this reduce algorithm. If you're doing something like taking a sum of, of all the things with the same key, you can do that in the, in, the, in the combiner phase before you do the shuffle and you'll have to send less information. So it will, um, Um, so this will aggregate um, values um, with the same um, key um, pre-shuffle. Right, so, okay. Um, so let me go through an example algorithm. Um, and hopefully this will, this will still be more, more clear. So, the, um, so basically, the hello world of, um, of MapReduce is word count. And so this is where the, the, the input, your big data set, is going to be um, text. Right? So you have this huge block of text. And each, you apply a whole bunch of these different files. Or maybe you just have one really long text file which you've broken up into these blocks. Right? So you can think of them as these, these key value pairs for each of the sub documents, or you can think of them as just the uh, they've just all the files have been concatenated into 64 megabit um, byte uh, blocks. Okay? So now we want to write the all we need to write now is the map function and reduce function and map reduce will take care of the rest of it. So we want and what we want to do is um, the um, the output is um, for um, for each word um, output the um, the number of times it occurs. So I told you there is at some point when I was mentioning the the heavy tail distributions. You know, I said the word. Um, the word the occurred 7% of all times in, in, in a lot of these corpuses. To do that, you need to count how many times it occurs. Right? So you want, to, you want to do this count for each of the individual words um, to figure out how many times they occur, what fraction they occur in the corpus. And so this is, this is the, the, the program you'd write for this in, in MapReduce. Okay. So, okay, so all we need to write is, is a function for map. <coughs> and a function for reduce. Okay, so how would we do this? So, so now think of, um, right, so, so, so what would we do for the map and reduce function? Well, for mapping, I mean, couldn't we just take basically a hash table of the words and the number of times they appear? Uh, or, or maybe it's, we just, it's gonna be it. even simpler, we don't need any data structures. So we're just gonna make we're just gonna make one pass over the text. And just maybe group all the words that have the same length together. Just set one. What? For each word, the the keywords we just set one after the we shuffle it. I agree with that. Right. Um, um for all words, uh, um you create a key value pair where you have the word and you have the one. You have one. The one is the count. How many times this word has been Okay, and then what do you do in, in this reduce step? Increment the count. Actually, the shuffle increases. Well, the, the shuffle, you, you actually don't do anything. The shuffle will bring all the key value pairs with the same word. Say this word is pi. All the instances of the word pi to the, onto the same machine. So then the input of um, of this reduce step is going to be um, um, this this word, and I think it's going to be a bunch of these values. Um, so, so, so it's going to be the set of these values: b two up to b k. And 
we have to take in this word and these values, and we need to output something. So, so that this is what the reducer needs to do. Reduce sum by dot sum. That's right. So the output is is going to be the word and the sum of um, these vi. And that's it. That's all you have to do. You have to write you have to write a parser over your document, which breaks it up into words, and you store them in this key value pair format, where you just have a one next to it. And then if this, this reducer, you know, the shuffle step has brought all the things with the same word together, and you have a one for each of them, and you just have to sum these up. So it's extremely simple. Right? So it's this is it's meant to be very easy to do. Um, Okay, so the one other thing you could do is this combiner step. So this would go before the shuffle phase. Could you use the combiner inside of this word count pro program? Uh, right, so um, what do you mean like that? Um, in what situation would you have a two instead of a one? What was the rule of what was the question? Um, the combiner is something you do to the key value pairs in one block before you execute the shuffle step. So you make a pass over the data in your block, and then you can just, you have these key value pairs, you can just send them to the shuffle step, but you can also, you can do something to compress the data before the shuffle step. So, so it was the right answer, but, but tell me when you're able to get something like a two instead of a one. Yeah, think of it's think of it just one really long book, okay. right? And you your block is like uh, is is ten pages of text. Right. Well, so you count the number of occurrences of. Um, you're, you're kind of getting close, but it's you're, you, need, you need to make it very simple, right? Instead of making the uh, key value pair for every unique word that you see, rather than that, you, know, you combine the count of the that single word in that particular block. You sum it up before you send the, you know, send it.